الحمدللہ رب العالمین نحمده و نستعینه و نستغفره و نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له و من يذلل فلا هادي له و اشهد و لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له و اشهد و انه محمد عبد الله و رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم نواصل ان شاء الله تعالى من دروسنا من باب الحج في هذه الليلة الاثنين <clears throat> we continue inshallah ta'ala from our read which is the chapter of hajj the chapter of hajj uh, by the <clears throat> we are reading from the book umnatul uh, ahkam by the great scholar uh, abdul ghani al maqdisi but today inshallah ta'ala we i chose to take some ahadith from bulugh al maram by the great scholar uh, Al-Hafid ibn Hajar al-Askalani. As we said, we will be alternating between the, the two or three books, inshallah ta'ala. Because there's few things that uh, Al-Hafid ibn Hajar brings that's important for us, that perhaps maybe uh, is more summarized in or, or he, in more detail put in the book of Bulugh al-Maram, inshallah ta'ala. So yesterday we spoke of, I think, three or two issues, main issues. The first issue we spoke of the virtues of Hajj. We spoke of the people who do the Hajj and we mentioned the Hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said Al-Hajj Al-Hajj al-Mabrur Laysa lahu jazawun illa al-Jannah The one who comes with the act of Hajj there is no reward for that person except yani, for the Jannah Jannah is the reward for that person And we said Al-Umrata Bain al-Umrata Kafaratun Bainahuma We mentioned the Hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Hadith of Abi Huraira where he said that the Umrah, between another Umrah, is an expiation of one's sins. And then he goes on to say, the person who does the action of Hajj, who comes with a complete acceptance of Hajj, there is no reward but the Jannah for that person. And we spoke about what does it mean to, yani, to come with yani, the Hajj al a Hajj that is accepted. And we spoke of a few aspects. We, spoke, we, we talked about the book of Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, where he spoke, he spoke, he brought five aspects or five ways that a person can attain or get to the level or be in the category of one's hajj being accepted. We said, number we spoke of it, number one, being sincere. Number two, we spoke about also, um, we spoke about following, staying away from the sins. And from them, we said, staying away from the innovation and the acts that are displeasing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then also we spoke about... <coughs> We spoke about yani, Hajj bringing patience to one's life, adorning yourself with a good character and bringing, bringing a soft heart. And these are the things that will bring about Hajj al and, and which was the nafaqa, meaning one's spending to be correct. And, and also from the things that yani, does not have riyah, does not have showing off and things like that now. It has to be things that are purely and solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we also spoke of the miqat. We spoke of the checkpoints. This is where I would say we spoke about the checkpoints. We mentioned the hadith of Ibn Abbas, where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَكَّدَ لِأَهْلِ الْمَدِينَ He put a place, he put in place a checkpoint for the people of Medina. And we said the checkpoint for the people of Medina is Dhul Hulayfa. The people of Dhul Hulayfa, that is the, the place for the people. And we said for لِأَهْلِ Sham, is it for the people of, of Sham, it is Ju'fa. And for the people of yani, Najd, it is Qarn al-Manazil. Wali ahl al-Yaman yalamnam. And we said these are the four agreed throughout the scholars of Sunnah, the Fuqaha. They said these are the four checkpoints the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, placed forth. Naam. So, and we said that this is important to us because even though we're not from Najd or, or we're not from Sham or we're not from Yemen, but you find ourselves that if we come into to Makkah from any of these places, wherever, whatever place we come in from, that will be our checkpoint. And we said in Hajj, the checkpoint for the people who are already in Makkah, the checkpoint will be Makkah from wherever they are. From wherever we are. I said that's the issue of Hajj. That is for the issue of Hajj. And we, we spoke about that briefly. Then we went into the issue of Ihram. We started the issue of Ihram, which is quite lengthy. We spoke of the hadith of the Masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the, the companion came to him and asked about the wearing of Ihram. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa told him the things that are forbidden to be worn when, when a person is in the ihram. So that's where we stopped, I would say. That's where we... Yeah, but today we'll, we'll probably have a bit of repetition between the mawaqit with, with the checkpoints. And also we'll have a bit of repetition when it comes to ihram because we're going to be speaking of ihram right through. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. 
<coughs> so from the few things which we said yesterday that um that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam disallowed the men in wearing we said it is the qamis which is a something known as a shirt that, uh, which is a sarawil which is worn from the waist which is basically the i would say the pants the trousers or I'd say uh, not really the trousers but something short in the trousers it could be it could be something like to cover um uh, something that's worn from the waist until one's knees and then the pantalon the pantalon which is the trousers something that's tight that's what the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbid it also in this hadith that the, the people should not wear that and the amama the things that we wrap around our heads and the jalabiya which is uh, the baramis which is the moroccan a thobe, we spoke about that it is a jalabiya which is a hoodie and the zafran something that's saffron yellowish something that's colorful something that stands out that is forbidden to be worn in the ihram and alwaras alwaras is something it's known to be yellow uh, it changes color and also it has a it has a good smell alwaras is a tree it has a good smell so that indicates also it means perfume something that will bring good smell and perfume wa hakada and we mentioned the hikmah behind this is to acknowledge that hajj the idea of hajj everyone should be as far as possible from adorning oneself everyone should be looking the same and this is a reminder for the person who is doing the hajj to be detached from the dunya to be detached from the dunya now and all of this is haram for a person to come with and we spoke about that yesterday and it already is agreed throughout the sunnah so all of this is specified for the men and yani both for the women to an extent this yani we, we didn't speak about that's inshallah what we going to speak we going to speak about today briefly be the light ala but before that inshallah we're going to speak of the the hadith that comes in the bulugh al-maram the hadith that comes in bulugh al-maram that will be speaking of the types of hajj the types of hajj the nusuk as we know hajj has its types and these are vital points these are very important points now the hadith that comes to that we reading from is the hadith of aisha um al-mu'minin um The, and it's, it's a chapter where he says babu hujuhi al-ihrami wa sifati so it's around the ihram as well he says the manners and the nature of the ihram so many people will think ihram is only that particular garment that a person wears which is the upper garment the lower garment that's what people think but ihram is more than that ihram is when you enter into that that takes the whole meaning of ihram so we'll understand that inshallah ta'ala the hadith of aisha she says and aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anhu or anha قالت خرجنا مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم آم الحجة الوداع عائشة mentions we went out with the messenger of Allah peace and blessings be upon him may Allah raise his rank in the year of the farewell pilgrimage حجة الوداع we the only year the messenger performed the Hajj فمنا من أهل فمنا فمنا من أهل بأمرته she says while some of us they said the talbiya mean they took the intention for umrah now this is very important this hadith now wa minna man ahalla bil hajj wal umrah in the second group of people they had the intention for hajj and umrah so the first group of people they made the intention for umrah the second group of people they made the intention for hajj and umrah وَمِنَّا مَنْ أَهَلَّ بِالْحَجِّ And this from us, the same group of the people who traveled the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they made the intention for hajj alone. So there's three groups of people who are traveling with who? The Messenger alayhi wa sallam. According to Hadith Aisha. She says, the first group of people, they made the intention for Umrah. The second group of people, they made the intention of hajj and the Umrah. And the third group of people, they made the intention specifically for the hajj. طيب. So people should know when it comes to Hajj, there are three types of Hajj that a person can perform. And these types of Hajj, the types of Hajj, these are basically when a person becomes into Ihram. Number one is 
the one she's mentioned first. She said, when, she said خَرَجْنَا مَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ We went out with the messenger. آمُ الْحَجَّةُ الْوَدَى The year of Hajj al-Wada. فَمِنَّا مَنْ أَحَلَّ بِالْأُمْرَى The first group of people, they had the intention of Umrah. That Hajj is called Tamattu. It's called Tamattu. He does the Umrah. That it's, what, what does it what does Tamattu mean? A person that doing the Umrah at any time in the sacred months. Which are the secret months we mentioned? We said the Shawwal, the Al-Ka'ada, and the Al-Hijjah. So a person sets on a journey. He goes to Mecca. He maybe he's on a business trip. And he decides to perform Hajj. When he, I mean, he decides to perform Umrah. If he decides to perform Umrah, then he stays there. Then, he, he, then after he performs the Umrah, he takes out his Ihram, he does his business. Then Hajj time comes, the Yawm Al-Nahar, the Yawm the eighth day. Then he... Goes, he joins the Hajj people. That's the first type of Hajj, Tamattu. And that's why the scholars, they said, that it's not good for the person to go to, for example, the Mamlaka in today's time, and they go to Mecca in the, year, in the months of the secret months, which is the, the months of uh, the secret months, and when they get there, they come back. If they perform in Umrah, they might as well also perform Hajj. They might as well perform Hajj. And this is something that I personally also see a lot of people do. If they go to Mecca at this time, they just stay there until the Hajj time comes. Because it's from the sacred months. The scholars are by the opinion that if you enter Mecca and you do the Umrah, alayka an bil Hajj. You need to come with the Hajj. But Allah knows best because of the times differences and also the, the, the fact that people have to have Tasri and, 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 and these type of license of Hajj, whatever you, permits of Hajj. So it's different today's time. Now, so the first type of Hajj, she says, the people, they intended to go ahalla bin Umrah. They, had, they took the talbiyah, the intention for Umrah. The second group of people in the hadith of Aisha, she speaks of, she says, the second people, وَمِنَّا مَنْ أَحَلَّ بِالْحَجِّ وَالْأُمْرَةِ And from us, there were a group of people that intended to do the Hajj and the Umrah. So if you look at the first individual, perhaps maybe he travels, he does not have the intention to do the Hajj. He just goes for Umrah. Then when he's there, he says, you know what, I'm going to stay for Hajj. The second group of people is the one who intends to do Umrah and Hajj. What is that called? Naam. So that is called... Al-Qaran. <coughs> Al-Qiran. So the person is doing Hajj and Umrah simultaneously. Like together. Combined. That's the second type of hajj, of nusuk, that a person can come with. And number three, which is what was mentioned in the hadith of Aisha, وَمِنَّا مَنْ أَحَلَّ بِالْحَجْ She says, from us, there were a group of people who only intended the hajj. And that is called al-ifrat. That is called al-ifrat. That is called al-ifrat. So when you put them into three, the first one who travels in the secret months, he goes... He only performs Umrah, then he removes his ihram. He shaves his hair, hakada. He lives, he goes on, he has, he lives, he goes on, he does his things, da basabidarik. He is in the category of the first people, which was Tamattu. The second group of people, they have the intention of Umrah and Hajj. So they go there, and when they get there, they cannot remove the ihram. They get to Mecca. They cannot remove the ihram until after, obviously when the ritual falls down, that is after the yawm, the yawm al-nahar, that's when they can remove the ihram, I mean the days of hajj. That is <coughs> al-kiran, combined. And the third one, which is al-ifrat, which is only hajj. When I mean, the person arrives in Mecca on the eighth day, the hijjah, then he joins the people, he goes for Hajj. And then he gets, he finds me, and he goes to Muzdalifah, all the places of Hajj, which is Amina, Muzdalifah, then the Arafah. Now, so the question comes, which Hajj did the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do? Because Rasulullah only did one Hajj. So that's one question a person needs to ask themselves. And does it differ based on reward now? Because a person has done Kiran, or a person has done Tamattu, or a person has done uh, ifrat, which one is level high? 
That's what we, we because we want the best. If I either bahtum fa ahsinu dhabha. When you slaughter and you get to the best. You get to the to the best you want the best reward. And either sa'alta fa either wa either sa'al al jannas is alillah al infirdos. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa told us when you ask for the jannah, ask Allah for the firdos now. So which is the hajj that the messenger alayhi salatu wa salam do? Now, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, in short, there's a lot of discussions I can say, but the Prophet, in peace, he done the hajj called Al-Qiran. Al-Qiran, which is Al-Qiran, and then he arrived in Mecca with the intention of Umrah and Hajj at the same time. I mean, he performed this Umrah, he didn't come out of Ihram, the garments, he stayed and he went on to Hajj. He went on to Hajj. And this, by any chance, this does not, yani, it does not uh, degrade, or it does not, what can I say, the, when it comes to, tam- if a person is doing tamattu, a person is doing uh, uh, the other type of Hajj, it does not mean the person's reward is decreased. Hajj reward remains the same. Whatever intention you come with, whatever Hajj you do, it remains the same. It remains the same. According to Ahlul Ilm, it remains the same. Because the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in, 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 in essence, he was going to be performing Al-Qur'an. Naam is going to be performing Al-Qur'an, the Hajj, where he has the intention of Hajj alone. And then when he reached a certain place, the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibn Abbas, he mentioned radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he had a dream. Where he says, Atani al-layla, Atani al-layla. Min Rabbi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent someone, an angel, from his Lord. فَقَالَ سَلْ سَلْ فِي هَذَا الْوَادِ الْمُبَارَكَ وَكُلْ أُمْرَةَ وَكُلْ أُمْرَةَ وَالْحَجْ He says, an, an angel came to him in the night when you are sleeping. And he said, pray in this valley and then come with the Hajj and Umrah. So then based on that, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with Yani, he came with, uh, what is this, uh, Al-Ifrat. Is it Ifrat now? Tamattu. No? He came with Al-Qiran. No, I said, Jazakallah khair. He came with Al-Qiran, which is combined, combined Hajj and Umrah. So his intention was to do Ifrat, sorry. To do Hajj alone. But then he had the stream where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him that he should do uh, what is it? Uh, he should do if uh, he should do Al Quran, and also in other narrations, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he he said if he he had done Hajj again, he mentioned another Hajj. He said he told the people, he told the companions that if he had the ability to do Hajj again, he would do a different Hajj. He told the companions that. So that also indicated that any Hajj a person does is correct, and he has. A person does is correct. And also again, Fattakullah Mastatatum. And he worship Allah to the best of our ability. Other from the three categories of Hajj, they are difficult types of Hajj. For example, Ifrat could be much easier because you're only entering and you're going to do the Hajj. Then if you're going to do something like uh, Quran, which is now you combine Hajj and Umrah, staying in the Haram for a couple of days, it's quite tough. Again. And then you have also Though, okay, but again, the uh, when it comes to when it comes to the the Hajj of Tamattu, it's again also a bit easy in a sense where you get to you are relaxed, you already know you, you already know the weather, how it is in Makkah, so you're already used to the situation. So that one is much much more easier than all. Now, you already know what to expect in your time being in in, in the Muslim Hajj. Now, so this is the evidence that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he did uh, he did Al Quran. And he did Al-Qur'an. And that is what is known in the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the Nusuk. These are the three types of Hajj. As we said, no Hajj is different to Allah. As long as a person comes with those five awsaf, those five descriptions we spoke about yesterday, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, the person bi-idhnillahi will achieve and get to the category of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, those people are from Hajj or Mabrur. Those people from Hajj have been accepted now. Now, so then from this, فَأَمَّا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْبِعُمْرَةِ فَحَلَّ إِنْدَنَا قُدُومِهِمْ وَأَمَّا مَنْ أَحَلَّ بِالْحَجْ أَوْ جَمَعَ بَيْنَ الْحَجْ وَالْأُمْرَةِ فَلَمْ يَحِلُّ حَتَّى كَانَ يَوْمُ النَّحْرِ وَاتَّفَقُنْ عَلَيْهِ So we said that these people who only wanted to do Qur'an, or Ifrat, sorry, they made the intention, yani they, they, they arrived in, they arrived in, they arrived in Mecca on the eighth day of the Hijjah, and they performed the Hajj, normal. 
As for the one who came with a tamatu, he didn't have the intention. Then before the days, he just intended to do the hajj as well. So now we're going to the etiquettes of ihram. Then we're still under the same issue. We're going to say, yeah, the etiquettes of all ihram. Ihram means, when I said yesterday, when I said now, many people only think of ihram as the clothing, the garment itself. But there's many things that comes under ihram. It comes under ihram. From them is, we, the meaning of ihram, when a person says, what does ihram mean? It says, duhulu fi ihrami. It means in the Arabic language, it means to enter in that which is prohibited. If you like translate it literally. To enter into that which is prohibited. What does it mean? What do they mean when things are, are prohibited? Because there are certain things that are made halal. Eating, drinking, relations with one's spouse, hakatha, these type of things. But when a person comes to ihram, these things are now prohibited. Like similarly with salah, tadbir al-ihram. Allahu Akbar, the eating becomes haram, the speaking becomes haram. That's already the same. So now things are things when you enter into the state of ihram, there are things that become haram. They have become prohibited for us. So but now in the Sharia, we we say it's near to duhul fi umrah or hajj man or huma man. They say it is a person having the intention to go for the umrah or hajj. Or umrah on its own or hajj on its own. You enter into the issue of prohibition. We have in the intention. That is ihram. So a person, what, how, when you go into ihram, you state the nusuk. You have the intention of what you're doing. You're either going to be doing your umrah. Labbaik Allahumma. Labbaik la um, labbaik la, labbaik la umrat labbaik. Or labbaik Allahumma labbaik if it's for hajj. Now, So if you look at the hadith here of uh, Umar bin Khattab, he says, Babu ihram wa ma yata'allaku biha. He says the chapter of ihram and that it's of its related activities. And Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma qala ma ahalla rasulallah illa min indi al-masjid muttafaqun alayhi. He says the narrator, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he, yani, he did not do the talbiya. Ahalla means to say labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Except from the masjid. So this hadith of Umar bin Khattab here, it brings up a question now. Because the masjid, the, the scholars dispute this issue. They say, the masjid sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did the talb here, or he made his intention of hajj from a masjid. So people disputed and said, it means that he made from the masjid in Nawawi of Medina. That's what people said. But that is, is incorrect. It is incorrect. What is known is the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made his intention from Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa. And that's where he received that hadith, that had the dream of the angel coming to him and saying that make the intention of Umrah al-Hajj. Pray in this valley. That's what he told him. So that is agreed by the Imamain now. Because some of the people use this evidence and said we, we can go and make an intention for Masjid al way. Some people said that. Yeah. And that's why a man came to Imam Malik, Imam Darul Hijra, Imam of Medina. He said, he said, Oh Imam Malik, I want to make the intention, I want to make the talbiya. Talbiya is intention. When I make the talbiya, labbaik Allahumma labbaik from Masjid al Haram. And then Umar bin Khattab said, La taf'al, do not do that. I mean, not Umar bin Khattab, Anas bin Malik. I mean, Malik, Imam Malik said, La taf'al, do not do that. And then from there he says, why? But I want, I'm the one who's going to be in pain. I'm the one who's going to be doing that. It's, I'm the one who's in difficulty. I want I mean, the reward. And then from the Imam Malik said, Akhafu an takhsha al-fitna. Akhafu alayka al-fitna. He says, I fear for you a trial, a fitna. Because you will be doing taqarruban in Allah. You'll be doing an action to get closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam did not do. So he said, and then he said, then, then, he, then he quoted the verse where Allah said, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ an amri أَن تُسِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُسِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ So let those people who disobey his orders, نعم? let them know, be aware, that they will be fall into a fitna or they will fall into a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, what? that was the, the Imam Malik telling him, do not come with innovation. Even if it's good, do not come with that. Come with what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa did. So, 
This hadith proves that the Messenger والسلام, took his intention from Dhu Hurayfa. Now, a question comes What does it mean to take the intention from Dhu Hurayfa? Like you come in, you entered Medina now, you live in Medina. What does it mean now to take the intention of Dhu Hurayfa? Does it mean now you have to come out, say, that tell Bia the bus has to stop, whatever you're taking, the train has to stop? Wahakada, does it mean that? Or so many of those people who are flying, for example, to not from Medina, from other places, other checkpoints. What happens in that case? In what happens in that regard? What do they do? Naam, what is known is that a person, from the time they they've left the Medina, maybe the place or the hotel they're staying in, let them come with the intention. And when they get to the Hulayfa, then they just go into Talbiya, la bayk Allahumma la bayk, la bayk Allahumma la bayk, like that. That is what is known. I mean that a person does not specifically have to specifically come out and do a ritual there. That's what is meant there. Some people, some of the people, what they would do, maybe like for the brothers, they wear something inside, and before they reach Dhu uh, Hulayfa, they will remove the shirts, and then they will put the upper garment, which is the, the, the ihram, and that is your juice, that is fine. That is to do. That is to do. But also, what is known from the Sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to make ghusl, which the hadith will come, is to make ghusl, yani before, or by the checkpoint, one of the two things you can do. The person makes the ghusl, the ghusl bath, before the checkpoint or by the checkpoint. Now, that's what he's mentioned there. But as I said yesterday, there's a lot of other things people add on, and that is an innovation that people should be warned about now. So when it comes to talbiya here, what do they mean of talbiya? What does talbiya mean? La bayk Allahumma la bayk, la bayk la umarata la bayk, like that. Those what I mean. That's what if you're doing it for a person, you mention the person's name in that time. So here the question is a question comes. For the brothers, they say it loud. The scholars is disputed in the issue of the woman. Do they also mention it loud? Do they also say it loud? So there's two positions that comes to this issue. The position number one is it's specifically khasal al-rijal. It's specifically for the men. That's the first position. The second position, they said it is general for both the woman and the man. Both the woman and the man. And the first position people who came with that they don't have an evidence to, yani to, to back them down, to say that, that it is specifically for the men. There's no evidence that clearly says that khasa rijal. Because the hadith that comes here is the hadith of Khalid. He says, An Abi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala atani Jibreel. Jibreel came to me. Fa'amarini, he commanded me an Amara Sahaba Ayyarfa Aswatahum Bil Hilal. He said the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the companions to raise their voices when they're doing the talbiya. La bayk Allahumma la bayk. That is from Dhul Hulayfa. Or that is from Yalam Nabi coming from Yemen. Or like that. So the question came or dispute came between the scholars for the woman. What's their position in this regard? As we said, what is known according to Ahlul Ilm is that this is Specific for men, and the other position said it is general for both the woman and the man. And what seemed to be strong in the, in the Ahl Sunnah, it is both women and men. They must raise their voices. Even if walau marratun wahida. Even if it's only done once. Like for example, the sister says, la bayk Allahumma la bayk. When she's heard, wa that is only once, and that's it. That she can say it when she hears herself. That is what is known to be. To, that's there, that's clear. Because there's no evidence against forbidding the sisters. In fact, there's an evidence that supports the sisters. The hadith of Aisha, Umm al Mu'minin. Aisha, Umm al Mu'minin, which is narrated by Rawa Abi Shayba, in his Musannaf, and Qasim Qala, Kharaja, Kharaja Mu'awiyah, Laylatan, al Nafari. He says, Mu'awiyah came out in the, the night of Nafar, the night, the night before the, the night of the, the eighth night. Of the Hijjah. Fasama asawtan talbiyatan. He said he heard a voice that is doing the talbiya. La bayk Allahumma la bayk. La bayk la sharika la la bayk. In alhamda wa al-na'mata like that. And that voice was loud. Faqala mahal man hadha. They said who is that? Faqala Aisha too. They said it is Aisha, Umm al-Mumneen. I'atamaratu. 
she took she made her intention from Masjid Aisha ten, ten im. because in the time of the Masjid sallallahu alaihi wasallam when they were doing the when they were doing the Hajj al-Wida Aisha she went into her menses she went into her menses and when they arrived in Mecca the mess, she told the messenger she became she was sad and she told the messenger that indeed I will miss the reward of Hajj and Umrah and the Masjid sallallahu alaihi wasallam told her go back to the checkpoint of Mecca which is Masjid, which is Tan'im. Now, come, now there's, a, there's a Masjid called Masjid Aisha. It's called Masjid Aisha because of her. It's in Mecca right now. This is outside of Mecca, outskirts of Mecca. He says, go there and make the Talbiyah from there. Make the intention from there. And she went. She sent, he sent Abdurrahman uh, ibn Siddiq, that, uh, he, her brother, to go with her to the, the outskirts of Mecca. And they came back together. And when she was coming back, she was doing this Talbiyah. And that's when Muawiyah and them heard and they said, who is that? And then from there, she, they said, that is Aisha, Umm al-Mu'mineen. And then from there, he says, then they told Aisha, Aisha was informed about that, that the people heard you, they heard you uh, raising your voice. And he says, she says, Lo sa'alani. if they asked me, Lo I would have told them it is me, I am Aisha, the one who's doing that. And this is an evidence of the talbiyah to be done. And the, the people have taken from this, Fuqaha has said, that even if it's once, at least once, let it be said, and that is what is known. That is what is not. And this is clear in the Zahiriya, in the Hanabila. I think Imam al-Shafi is a different opinion. Malik is a different opinion. Abu Hanifa is a different opinion. But it's clear among the Hanabila. Allah Ta'ala a'la wa a'la. Allah knows best. So they said, فَالسُنَّ لِلْإِمْرَى It is from the Sunnah. أَنْ تَرْفَى صَوْتَهَا That she should raise her voice. بِالْتَلْبِيَةَ In the Talbiya. Because there's no evidence against it. There's no evidence against it now. So the scholars view that it is not allowed now. And also from the issues also of ihram is the issue of now uh, one yani, doing the, uh, what can I say, the, the ghusl, the ghusl before wearing the ihram. What can be done and what can be, be put in the ghusl now? So a person can take the shower, clean themselves before, the, yani, before doing hajj. The scholars have taken hikmah that it energizes a person, it helps a person. It's also highly recommended to, before you place the ihram, to cut one's nails, and um, do the shaving of the, the body, wahakada. Now, it's highly recommended. And this is for both genders, both men and female. Now, now, even for the one who is in postnatal bleeding, they should take the ghusl. And this ghusl is normally to be taken, for example, in Masjid Aisha, I mean, the checkpoints, that is what is known, or before the checkpoints. Now, and then from the, the, the evidence for the, for, 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 for the woman is the hadith of Asma bin Umaysin where she arrived at Dhul Hulayfa, the checkpoint of Medina. When she arrived at the checkpoint of Medina, fi Dhul Hulayfa, she, ulidat, sorry, she gave birth. She gave birth in Dhul Hulayfa. And then Farasalat ila Rasulullah, she sent to the messenger. She said, Ya Rasulullah, kayfa asna? How, what should I do in this condition? Because she falls into postnatal bleeding. And the messenger then said, Ikhtasa, take the ghusl bath and continue. That's what the messenger said. Take the shower and continue now. So place your ihram, put your ihram, take the shower, put your ihram and continue. Now, so here scholars took it as a command. Some scholars said, because the messenger said, Ikhtasa, take the shower. So the messenger said, some of the scholars took it as if though you have to, you have to mother, you have to take the, uh, the ritual bath. You have to. But some scholars said it's recommended. Some scholars, like the scholar like Ibn Hazm, and then they said, this is a command from Rasulullah that a person needs to make sure at least by Dhul Hulayfa or these place checkpoints, the person takes the ritual bath. Now, and that's why they said, Al-Amr Yahdi Lil Hujub. There's a, there's a principle in fiqh, they said, a command indicates an obligation. A command of Rasulullah, it indicates its obligation now. And also from the things when it comes to ihram is can a person wear the watch? A person yes can wear a watch for the men now. Or also for the woman. Can a person have glasses on or a ring? Yes, they can do that. They can have that. And we mentioned this is the point we will speak about for this for the sisters. A woman is not allowed to wear the niqab and the glove. Oh yeah, we, and wear gloves. We mentioned the hadith that supports it, but is allowed to cover her face. If she uses a normal cloth, or I think, as I see, I think there are certain scarves or things that are made now. People can look at that, Allah alam. 
And we mentioned yesterday, some people wear a cap and they make it difficult upon themselves because they don't want the faith. And the, but we said, La, there's no blame. Sheikh Uthaymin and many scholars say, there's no blame if the cloth touches their face. There's no blame if the cloth touches, touches the face. And we, as we said, this, this, the people should not take this as a, a way to not cover their face. Rather, this is, it's important that a person covers their face. As we said, Hadith Aisha, when the people, when the riders would pass by, they would cover their faces. That's what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them now. That's what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them, that the people should do that. Um, so in that regard, then a woman also can wear whatever she feels like wearing, in terms of kala wa hakada, but let it be obviously covering it is correct. That is her ihram. And wallahi subhanallah, it's from su, it is from, it is, it is from, it is from not knowing the ilm. I remember doing hajj, and we seen women from Africa wearing the ihram. Because there were new Muslims from Guinea-Bissau and these countries, and they were just taking over, we seen them, and the authorities are telling them, no, you need to go and change. And they're like, they've been stubborn, they don't understand what's going on. So again, again, what we said yesterday, we talked about, we said, doing something with no knowledge, it brings more harm than the good. You will see amazing things. You will see things that will surprise you. And I'm so, that's another thing again. So covering is important to cover the face. As we mentioned, Hadith of Aisha, uh, where the people, would, uh, the riders passed them and she covered her face, which was mentioned there now. Which was mentioned, which, which, which was mentioned as well now from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And from the narrations that, um, that, um, that, uh, that gives the evidence of not covering the face is the hadith of, <coughs> the hadith of, hadith of Ibn Umar. We said it yesterday, but we didn't mention the narration of Bukhari. Bukhari's narration, he says that, وَزَادَ الْبُخَارِ فِي الْرِوَايَةِ وَلَا تتنقب. They should not put the niqab. الْمَرْعَةَ muhrima, The one who is in ihram. وَلَا تَلْبِسْ الْقَفْزَيْنِ And she's going to wear the gloves. That is the evidence. But we said that they can wear anything else, but not these type of things. They can cover their feet and everything else. Shaykh Albani authenticated this narration. Shaykh Albani authenticated this narration. And also from the evidence also is the narration of, of and Malik, and Malik, and he said, it was said to him, and Nafi, Nafi said to him that Abdullah ibn Umar, his teacher said to him, that Kana Yakul, it was said, La tunaktikil, La tankib, they should not put the niqab, they should not put the niqab, but they should, they should not also cover with gloves, but they should cover their faces and hold that modesty, because this is a time of reflection. So these are the times also that certain rules are specific for Hajj. That's what the scholars took it. Because people disputed the issue of niqab and whatnot with these ahadith, and people said, no, this is for hajj. Let's not bring into other things now. Now. Let's not bring into other things now. So it is permissible for the muhrima to wear any socks, to wear gold bagels as well, to wear watches, to wear rings, wahakala. it's normal, it's okay for them to do that. As long as she hides these adornments from the non-Nahram man during the Hajj and other times. That's what the scholars agreed on. But obviously a person wouldn't want to go and wear crazy things when they go for these things. Now they should just keep it simple, inshallah. So there's, there's, a, there's a term which I want to also correct, inshallah. The books of fiqh, they've mentioned a problematic term. And this is something that many of the scholars of today they try to teach the people as well. You find people, they mention that you're not allowed to wear tailored and stitched clothes. That's what people say. Now, so, you've, so you find people uh, who are cutting their shoes because uh, they, cause they, cause they're trying to cut the stitching parts of it in Mahakada. And this is an incorrect term. It's an incorrect, because the term is al muhitu and, um, and so if people translate it to stitched, it's incorrect. So you'll find it throughout the books of fiqh. With no doubt. For the people who used this before, the first people to use this was uh, Ibrahim al-Nakha'i from the Salaf and the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, Zafar. They used this term. Now, but so for example, if, what, what do I, how do we correct this? But if a person, for instance, they take uh, maybe a lower garment, the, the lower garment, the, the lower garment of the ihram, the izar, and they stitch it. For example, they stitch it for you not to fall down. There's no issue with that. 
Some people see there's something that's wrong. It's nothing wrong with that. If a person ties his stitches, so the his stitches, and we see that we see certain ihram where you can stitch it where it doesn't fall down. Now it remains like firm, I would say. There's la basi bidarik. Scholars have permitted it, and the sunnah also permits that now. They mean that also what is meant here, the person should not go into extreme and doing cutting things that are not that are not needed to be cut. That's what is meant here. Also, that's what the scholars have said, yeah. So this tells you the importance of yeah, and he, like certain certain uh, certain uh, translations, they give us teaching, but it's not really as it is. If a person teaches, la bas bidalik for the right reasons, of course. Yeah. And the last point I also to mention when it comes to ihram is the hadith on tayyib, is meaning that tayyib tayyib means to uh, tib, sorry to uh, uh, perfume oneself. The hadith of Aisha Umm Al-Mumin radiyallahu taala anha qalat kuntu utayyib Rasulullah. She said. I used to perfume, I used to put perfume on the Masjid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Lihrami, before, yani, Lihrami, if you translate it literally, it says on his ihram. But it means that before he goes into the state of ihram. Remember, ihram is not only specifically the clothing of ihram. Qabla ay yuhrim. Wa lihilli qabla ay yatufa bil bayti muttafaqun alayhi. So here, Aisha Munmin tells us something that's very important. She says, that she used to um, perfume the Masjid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before he wears that garment. Meaning that he takes the ghusl, then he would to tip, he would he would he, and he would put oud on him and perfume on him. Now so this shows that it shows that this hadith shows the permissibility of putting atar on the body before the miqat. And this is mainly to the men. This is mainly to the men. So also, this also tells, even for the sisters, for example, they want to put deodorant, it is yet used to do this. For example, you've taken the ghusl, bath for ihram. In that state, you can put the deodorant. And also, Hadith Aisha, the other narration where she said, she would place a lot of oud on him. That even when he's done with the hajj, when he's, done, when he's before, in the time of hajj, you, you, and you would see him glowing. His smell will still be there. The good smell will still be there. So here the people who say they would go into extreme or put in Allah Bas I've seen people do that, subhanAllah. I remember my first Umrah, I seen people do that. And because of lack of understanding, I thought people's hajj, I, I, I disputed with people thinking the hajj is incorrect. I remember seeing my, a friend of mine is doing that. He was doing, putting oud in Akhara and I'm like, then we did the hajj and I was, the whole Umrah I'm thinking of, we did the Umrah, the whole Umrah I'm thinking of this Umrah is not, it's not correct. Then I came to this bab, and I came to this, and I said, SubhanAllah, because of so, I was disputing with him the whole time, and saying, your umrah is not correct, man, your umrah is not correct. But again, ill, having the knowledge before, going with these things. So a person can go into extreme, because obviously it's a couple of days, you're not going to be putting deodorant and these type of things. A person can't do that now. As we said, for the sisters, they can do it to a certain extent. For example, deodorant, soap, hakala, la basa bidarik. But again, do not go into extreme. Now, avoid that now. Now, so, and then from the second part of the hadith, and then also she said, after tahallul al awwal, at tahallul al awwal is the first hitting of Jamrat, yawm al nahar. After yani, the yawm al nahar, the day of Eid, when you hit the Jamrat, then now you're allowed to take out your ihram. Then Aisha says she used to adorn him again. With perfume, she would put a lot of perfume on the Messiah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yom al nahr. So remember, after the day of nahr, everything is allowed, except maybe relations with one spouse. Everything is allowed, cutting hair, wahakada nam. And as we said, the Hadith Aisha she said, when I read Allah Taala on her, قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا رميت if you threw if you يعني you stoned وَحَلَقْتُمْ فَقَدْ حَلَّ لَكُمُ الْتَيِّبِ And then you have cut, you shave in your hair, يعني, it is allowed for you to, to, يعني, to adorn yourself with perfume. That's the after the day of, and the day of, uh, the day of Nahr. Now, I think that inshallah ta'ala will suffice us for this evening, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we still have to go through the entry of Makkah. We still have to go through uh, the entry of Makkah and also a few other things. Perhaps me, if I missed out, inshallah, we'll cover them in the next couple of lessons. Be in the light, Allah. I'll stop here today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu wa lahi lahi illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.